Well, good morning. And uh, it's nice to be in Dallas on a nice chilly morning. Uh, this is what I'm used to, plus ten, minus 10 uh, every day. So uh, I, I'm amused by your top coats, believe me. Um, we are uh, finishing up the uh, uh, 28th chapter of Proverbs, and uh, Lord willing, we'll get to 29.1 this morning. Uh, before we begin, let's have a prayer for Mark and his family as Stanton continues to improve and is now moved out of intensive care and to a rehab hospital. Um, thank you, Father, for again allowing us to be together uh, for the teaching ministry of the Word, and we uh, lift up your choice servant and our friend Mark Newman, Cindy, uh, our prayers are for them and the entire Newman family, particularly for Stanton. And we're so grateful for her, his progress uh, that you have, by your providence and a marvelous grace, have brought this boy back one step at a time. And we're so grateful for that. We uh, continue to pray and ask that you would give the doctors wisdom and give, his, uh, give him the courage and the stamina and the fortitude to go through his rehabilitation and that you would restore this man uh, by the power of prayer alone. And that's the only power we're concerned with. That's the true power. Not medicine, not doctors, not machinery, not equipment, but you who breathed into human nostrils and became life. So, Lord, again, we are grateful for Mark and for his service to us all. What a true servant he is. And we're grateful to come alongside he and Cindy and to pray diligently over their family at this time. And we do so in the powerful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, before we begin our lesson this morning, I've got to tell you, I was so amused by the news this week in the sports world you may not be in the sports world. I like the sports world. And I was so amused that one of our great athletes, predominant name that reigns in sports, could not figure out, according to his own testimony, whether he wanted to play another season and make $54 million dollars or not. And so he uh, thought that his, the best way for him to make that determination was to go into four days of darkness. And that's what he did. He got his one meal a day at six o'clock and he virtually lived in utter darkness. For him to have clarity, he said. Now, I talk to you all the time about the advantage that you have in wisdom and walking in wisdom, following the Word of God. Well, here it is. He goes into darkness to get clarity. What utter foolishness. Darkness? What does the Scriptures say? We walk in the light as He is in the light. But this is a man, by his own testimony, that told us that when he was involved in young life as a younger person in high school, and very interested that he decided that he didn't need the crutch. So he made a choice. He's on his own. And... 
Now, what does he do? Because he's on his own, he goes to the darkness to get clarity. To get clarity is to follow the Word of God. To get clarity is to hear what God has to say about you and about your providence. And I was totally amused by that whole thing. And everybody was all intent in listening. Oh, this is magnificent. It's foolishness. And here we are. We open the Scriptures. We're informed. Here's the providence of God. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge Him. But see, He doesn't do that. He leans on His own understanding. He goes into the darkness. Foolishness. He will make your path straight. I visited with a geologist one time. He was a Christian. Mark, uh, I, I just really have a lot of trouble with this uh, idea of uh, universal flood, he said. Uh, you, you just have to understand the geology. I've, I've understood the geology. Uh, what do you say? Just keep reading the Scriptures, is what I say. Just keep reading the Scriptures. And before he died, he said, you're right. The Scriptures are right. My thinking and my education were wrong. Just stay in the Scriptures. They are teaching you, they are guiding you, and they are leading you. Proverbs 28, beginning in verse 13. The one who conceals his transgressions will not succeed. Very important word. Uh, we'll look at that word in detail. But the one who confesses and abandons them will obtain mercy. 14. Uh, this is, this is a, an interesting proverb. Blessed is the man who you have fears. It's really a different word. I'll show you the word. It really trembles. Uh, but fears is the idea behind it. Continually or always, but the one who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Now this is a proverb that has a real secret to it. And I want to open that secret up to you because it's very interesting. Uh, 20, we skip from 14 to go to 20. A faithful man abounds in blessing, but one who hastens or hurries, that's the word, to get rich will not escape punishment. 28, 24, the one who robs his father and mother while saying there is no crime, he is a companion to one who destroys. Word destroys is interesting. Uh, 28, 27. As for the one who gives to the poor, there is no lack of want. That's the word. But the one who shuts his eyes has many curses. And then we're springing our way into the 29th chapter. Can you believe it? 29, 1. As for the person often rebuked and hardened his neck in an instant will be broken and without remedy. A very stern warning from the book of Proverbs for us all. Well, we open this study with 2813, the one who conceals his transgressions. This is a very, very difficult and complex proverb. Uh, this is the only proverb in the entire book that calls for confession of one's sin. 
Here's the complexity. Back in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, the wisdom of the book told us to pacify a transgression with love, covering offenses or transgressions of another. Here it is, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. But although that is my behavior toward you, I personally can cut myself no slack as regarding my own personal transgressions. I think this is exactly what the Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. He said, like an athlete, I discipline myself. I beat myself up, so to speak, that I would keep myself under control at all times, that I not be offensive. I would not be uh, disqualified. So, to be clear, wisdom says, I practice love to you by covering your transgressions, but when it comes to myself personally, I give myself no liberty. I am harsh on myself. And I think that's Paul's clear point. Now, I have this word, conceals or covers. It was used by Judah to his brothers after they had dropped Joseph into that cistern out there at Dothan. Um, and they left him to die in that cistern, dehydrate and die. But then Judah suddenly, remarkably, spots a caravan of Ishmaelites coming just in time. And so he says, Genesis 37, 26, What profit will we gain to kill our brother? Here is our word, and cover his blood. So the word cover is used for covering over hatred, actually. And that's the way Joseph puts it. Here, it's transgression used often of strife, revulsion toward another. And the promise is, notice the word will, it's lack of success. That word succeed, I'm going to hold out because I want to give that full expression at the end of the proverb because this being so complex, this interesting proverb really involves New Testament theology, and I want to explore that with you. But the one who confesses, that word confesses is used of Joshua when the lot fell upon Achan, the son of Carmery, who took gold from Jericho, and Joshua said, Give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, Honor him, and here's your word. Confess. It's the same word as our proverb. Confess what you have done. Often the word is used of public praise in acknowledgement of one's need for forgiveness and restoration. Now the and here in your proverb in line two, so important because, see, it binds the confessor to the activity of abandon, the one who abandons. The word is used in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 13 of the wicked man who speaks perversely. And here's our word. Leaves or abandons the straight path to walk in the ways of, looky there, darkness. We go into four days of darkness to clear our minds. But what do the Proverbs say? Confessing and abandoning is a twofold action here. 
giving God praise by acknowledgement of our sin and thus abandoning them. Now, look at this concluding promise, because it is a promise from the Proverbs. Obtains mercy. That's your will, the future certainty. Interesting word here. The emotion of a mercy. Now, what is that? Well, it's very interesting. It is a superior acting upon an inferior. That's the idea behind this word. The victor in warfare extends mercy to the defeated army. It is our God extending to us His grace, His mercy, which we absolutely and emphatically do not deserve. Now, Psalm 103. I want you to look at Psalm 103. Hold your spot there. And I want to look at Psalm 103 and verse 8. Because people say that the Old Testament is a God of wrath and punishment. No, it's a God of a a full-throated explanation of His attributes. That's what the Old Testament is. But I want you to see that this Old Testament expands on forgiveness and loving kindness extended to the believer from the Lord. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 8. Look at this. The Lord is, this is His attribute. This is who He is. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in hesed. There's your covenant faithfulness. He will not always accuse, neither will He retain His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, neither according to the iniquities has He repaid us. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His covenant faithfulness toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is to the west, as far as the heavens, He has removed our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion on his children. What does the word mercy here mean? It is the superior dealing with the inferior. It is the parent dealing with the child. So, as the Father shows compassion on His children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear Him. For He knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. What a great and loving and kind and generous and compassionate God we have. Now, that's the proverb. Let's get into some theology and some thinking about this very interesting proverb. And we really need help from the New Testament. But let's begin this way. What is the normal Christian experience? Is it sinlessness? (laughs) Hardly. We all know that's not true not true from the Word of God, and it, is, it defies progressive sanctification altogether. We constantly are in need of forgiveness. So what is this word that we skipped over? Success. Move forward. Well, here is the word in the Old Testament, and it has a lovely story to it. You won't forget it. It's Genesis 24, 12. It's where Abram sent his servant to procure a wife for his son Isaac. And this journey has been going on for about six months. He's got this whole team of camels with him. Doesn't make a lot of progress through any particular day. But he comes to a well and he sets those camels down to rest. And he's looking and surveying the situation, 
And so he prays. And his prayer is that may a young girl come out and offer to give me a drink and water my camels. And before he finished praying, out comes Rebecca. Now the Scripture says that he came running toward her. I've thought about that a lot. Running, why? Because I think she was the only one that was there. He wasn't going any meeny miny mo. No, he was. He saw one, and he ran toward her, and he repeats his prayer, and she repeats it back to him. This is all fitting together perfectly. What's taking place? Here's his prayer. O Lord, God of my master Abram, here's your word in the proverb. Grant me success. The King James translates it good speed. I like that. Because it's the idea of moving forward. What is the proverb saying? The proverb says, if you don't confess your sin, you're not really moving forward. You're going to stay in one place. Now, you go out from my house, and about an eighth of a mile, there's a north and south street called Western. And when I first moved to Oklahoma City, Western had one light, one, at a bridge, and the high school students painted it every Friday. It had 50 pounds of paint on it, I'm sure. Um, but they took that bridge down and they made Western a little, from a little two-lane road to a four-lane road. And uh, then they, in progress, started putting in the lights. Now I got nine lights. They put in another set of lights in 2023. So here's my little brain working. I'm going to get through all these lights. Now, how do I do that? And this light is not timed this way, but if I get to this point, if I know I get a landmark over here, if I'm, if I'm at this time, and I'm going to get through these lights, and I get, I've got through the one, two, three, but six and seven and eight, ah, I can't get through all the lights. Well, that's what God does with us. When you don't confess your sin, you go to the red light and you sit there and you contemplate it. You're going nowhere because He's teaching you something. And that's what the proverb is saying. You don't progress. Which got me to thinking. Look at the enemy of our soul. He brings us the Catholic Church. Well, the Catholic Church says, hey, you go to Mass, and you walk out, you're all clean and free. Um, how do you square that with Romans 6.10? Because at the Mass, you're recreating the death of Christ. But Romans Chapter 6 and verse 10 says the death of Christ, He died, He died once and for all. I'm not recreating anything. There was one death of Jesus Christ. And then the church there tells you, well, you're bound to that. So you walk out clean, but you're bound to have to come back to the church. And the church becomes the vehicle for your salvation. No, no. No, no. You are a priest, according to the New Testament, and your salvation is not bound in the church. It is bound to Christ. There is no substitute for Him. We as priests go to Him. Now, how do I advance spiritually? How do I get out of the red light? Well, 1 John 1, 9. 
If I confess my sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive my sins. I never get away from my sins. That's New Testament theology. My sin is on my flesh. My sin is me. And I can't ever cleanse it or get away from it. It's all a part of me. But here's what I do. I don't, I don't go to a Mass and wipe my hands and now I'm free and clean. No, what do I do? I continually, continually, continually confess my sin. That's the life of the believer. And I walk. And I fall. And I walk. And I fall. You ever see a child walk? Learning to walk? You walk, you fall. You walk, you fall. But you get the hang of it. And you are continually confessing your sins. Now, that's how you progress in the spiritual life. You walk, you confess, and you walk. You walk, you confess, and you walk. Now, back to this word, success, or good speed, the King James. 1 John 5.14 If we ask according to His will, He hears us. So according to His will, the things of God. What is that? Is that name it and claim it? No. Because here's how God answers our prayers. In His time and in His way. So, it takes time. Sometimes they're instant. Sometimes we wait a long time. Rebecca didn't have boys for a long time. Isaac prayed for her. And then the, the birth came. How did they progress forward? By trusting the Lord, waiting on Him, and praying about everything. What does 1 John 5.14 say? We ask according to His will, and He hears us. He hears us, and He answers in His time, in His way, and not according to our time and our way. I get stuck at the red lights. I don't like it. But that's the majority of time. When the servant came to that well and used our word in Genesis 24, verse 12, to succeed, move forward, Who did he ask that God would grant that for? You remember, he said, for my master Abram. Why? Abram had the promises. Abram, the promises were delivered to him to do what? Become a great and mighty nation. In order to do that, he had to have an heir. Would you show kindness to me in behalf of Abram. Let's go back to 1 John 5.14. If we ask according to His will, He hears us. I want to pray in the will of God. And I want to live my life in the will of God. What keeps me from doing that? Me? Myself? I hinder myself and my walk. So what is... God interested in and how do we move forward? I said this is a very complex proverb. Well, here's how we move forward. We confess our sins. That's how we progress in the spiritual life. Never clean, always dirty, but we progress. We move forward by a full acknowledgement of Him. And here's how that works. What is He interested in? Whatever you put your fingerprints on. Your life. Everything about you. That's what He's interested in. You're His sheep. You belong to Him. 
So what is he interested in? That you would walk out of a mass and say, well, I'm clean. No, because you're never clean. So what is he interested in? A relationship. You. If you abide in me and I abide in you. He's interested in you. And he wants you interested in him. And he wants to build that relationship day by day, every day. And as you do that, you progress. You move forward. And that's your word. And if you don't do that, you don't progress, you don't move forward, and you die. And that's the proverb. Here's uh, 14, blessed is the man who fears. Um, it's not in the text, but it's implied. And we are really actually trembling before the Lord continually. That's what we're doing. But the one who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. It's a very interesting proverb. We open here with the first five words verbatim of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who, Psalm 1 says, walk. Here is our verb to tremble. Reverent, or the King James, fear. The word is actually used by Job for dread. Awe. Take your breath away. We say, scare you to death. That's the idea. Job 3.25, What I feared has come upon me. Here's our word. What I dread has happened to me. That's the word. And it is in the context of continually, meaning a way of life, a wise conduct. I like Alvin De Silva's comment here. He said, to live this way, one maximizes life as God would have intended it to be. So, that's why your relationship with Him is so important. Because you are progressing through life. And we progress in Him. Not in ourselves. In Him. That relationship. That's what He wants with you. That's why He chose you before the foundation of the world. He has a big plan for you. And He has a plan and a purpose for your life. Oh, I'm 80. I, I'm, my days are over. Yeah, that was Moses standing in the midst of sheep on the Midian Desert. You don't know what his plan is. But it's a great one. And he picks up right here at this text today, forward. And that's where we want to be. Moving forward. See, this man, but the individual with the hardened heart. He's violated his conscience. He has repeated it so many times. He has now singed his conscience. He puts his hand on a hot stove and he says to you, I don't feel a thing as we, we smell the flesh burning. You know why he doesn't feel a thing? Because all the nerves are gone. That's your sin. That's why we constantly are confessing our sin, because we are revitalizing our relationship with Him every day. So the, Jew, the German soldier, he looks at the small child, and he has no compassion on this little Jewish girl, and he throws her into the train wagon. And the old people. He has no compassion. He has no conscience. It's all hardened. Now look at the consequences here. Consequences from the book of consequences will certainly fall. 
It's actually the figure for defeat, destruction, ruin in the Old Testament, and the word that is used is calamity. Evil, bad things. Proverbs 13, 15, the ways of the transgressor are hard. Now, here is the neat little secret about this proverb. The wise, according to the proverb, they tremble before the Lord. They fear Him daily. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom. They live like this daily. And as a result, they accomplish a great deal. How do I know that? I know that because I've read the book of Corinthians. Listen to the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I came to you, he said, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, he said. My message wasn't with persuasive words of wisdom, but only with a demonstration of the power of the Spirit. He walked into Corinth and there wasn't a Christian one there. He earned his way in with his life as an example before others. And he came not in confidence, but in weakness. Now, knowing that, what do the book of Proverbs say about our demeanor? You remember? We did it in 28.1. This chapter. Yeah. Bold as a lion. You see, that's the way others look at you. <clears throat> Bold as a lion. But on the inside, fear and trembling. Always fear and trembling. But the outward, people look and they say, how do you do that? How do you live that way? How can you do this? How can you... How can you bury your father and your mother and keep a smile on your face and peace in your heart? Why aren't you devastated? That's the boldness that you have, that the Spirit projects. That's the secret to the proverb. You have to go to the New Testament to think it through, but that's exactly what happens. And you are strong in the Lord and in His power. And that is what the Apostle prayed for with believers. Here's 24. The one who robs his father and his mother while saying there's no crime is a companion to the person who destroys. Now, here we drop to the bottom of the barrel in the book of Proverbs. The most reprehensible of unnatural behaviors is occurring here. Look, the child is brazen in his attitude. Line two, saying, there is no crime. We open the proverb with the top line, with the actions of the fool. The one who robs, that's the word, Proverbs 22, 22, do not rob the poor for they are the poor. That's your word. Notice both parents are indicated in the proverb. Father as well as mother. The teachers, they are the God-appointed teachers for the child in the home. So that is the line or the generations of. This is how uprightness is preserved by teaching wisdom in the home, in the home, in the home, in the home. Psalm 127, 1, except the Lord build the house, those who labor, labor in vain. What is the end result of that, of that psalm? The child. 
He will not be put to shame when he contends with his enemies at the gates. What is that? That's a confident child. That's a bold as lion child. That's not a weak child. That's a strong child. And here he is. And he is contending for righteousness. That's the end of the line for the Lord building the house and father and mother building into the child. Here it is, 1.8, My son, hear the instruction of your father and forsake not the law of your mother. So it's both parents. Here they go, working. Line two, a circumstantial qualifier here. It's the avarice activity. There is no crime. They may believe that they have ownership in the family property, the real property of the family. But you know what was my surprise? Every commentator, every one that I read concerning this proverb said emphatically that they don't. Here is R.J. Clifford. Children have no more right of their parents' property while they're living than a brigand from outside the family. You know what that statement highlights to me? Luke chapter 15, verse 12, the prodigal son. What does he say? Father, give me my share, my share of the estate while his father's still living. And what does the boy do? He plays the fool. Proverbs 20, 21, an inheritance gained in a hurry at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. Boy, how do I see that? in the oil and gas business in Oklahoma City. Line three, the root of the word companion means to join. It's the idea of being united. Our wedding vows, what God has joined together, see, that's it. Let no man put us under. So here's the fool's behavior. He joins himself. Look what the proverb says. Not to another person, but to a providence. What's the providence? The destroyer. 6.32, he who commits adultery has no sense and he destroys himself. The word literally means to bring devastation. So let's close the proverb with, again, some theology. I am to uh, honor my parents. That's uh, the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land that the Lord your God has given you. And the Apostle Paul reminded the Ephesian church that that is the first commandment with a promise. The Lord has given you everything and He has given you His eternal Word. So, I sit across from men and they tremble. Their chin quivers. Their eyes grow moist. Sometimes they bawl. They hate their father. They despise the home that they came from. You need to hear my story. I listen. How do we progress from that point? Well, what we talked about last week, first principles. Here's our starting point. It's our starting point because nothing preceded it. What was it? It was the Word of God. Not my own thinking. Not my own counsel. It's what God says. What did God say? He says, honor your father and your mother. So, I'm going to do that. And I make these men do that. Thank God for them. For better, for worse, 
wherever you came from, and we all came from someplace, we were all dug out of some hole someplace. Honor, do what the Scriptures say to do. First principle. And then what's the promise according to Paul? A blessed life. You'll inherit the land. You'll move forward. You'll progress. Don't get stuck at the red light there. Do what the Scriptures say. God selected your parents and put you on the earth with them. For some, that's a rich blessing and a great inheritance. For others, it's a sadness. But do what the Scriptures say to do. Honor them. Give them weight. Thank God for them. And you'll move forward. You'll progress. And you'll be blessed. The Old Testament says you'll be given the land. That's the blessing and grace of God for the people, for Israel. I don't want you to leave this room by being stuck at the red light. Let's follow the will of God. Not our own understanding, the will of God. Hear the Scriptures. Live them. Apply them. And that relationship that He wants with you, He will bless you in it and with it. That's how you move forward. And that's the proverb. Let's close. Thank you, Father, for Your eternal Word. It always speaks to us just where we are each and every day. And we're so grateful for them and so grateful for the New Testament that rounds them off and gives us a clearer perspective and understanding. Uh, thank You, Lord, for this Your Word and these Your people. May they grow powerful and may they accomplish much because they follow the voice of the great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus Christ, the creator of our eternal covenant. In Jesus' name, amen.